Ew. It's squishy. <laughs> that lag right there on the explosion. Oh man. MSI initially didn't want to send us a review sample for its claw, even though it had launched in non-US markets. It's just it wasn't available in the US at the time, so we had few options to get one. Now that's fine. We I was flying to Taiwan anyway, so uh, I replied and said, no worries, I'll buy one. And I did. It was $800. MSI immediately replied and said, wait a minute, we'll send you one. That always makes us a little skeptical just because our past with MSI indicates that the company's general strategy for things is to delay as long as possible. Not sure if that's what was going on here or not, but uh, I genuinely were, were skeptical. It's happened a lot in the past, and it'll take a while for them to uh, cure that skepticism. But it was immediately apparent when in Taiwan that stock was plentiful in the home turf. And in fact, MSI has a different problem than not being able to send units out. The problem is uh, the store clerk was extremely confused why I would want to buy one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're uh. <laughs> and that is one of the most popular PC stores, if not the most popular, in Taipei. Uh, and they had had it for about a month at that point. So that's not good news. Uh, I asked, what is everyone buying? And he said, the Asus Ally. And if you look at them, they're really similar. And when we did get the unit from MSI, oddly, that unit, the review sample, had been tampered with, despite them saying it'd represent retail. It had a Windows account created already, it had games installed, it had 3D Mark traces left behind, and none of this was included in the out-of-box version that we bought. The US device clearly had been used, and we never trust review hardware when it's been tampered with, and it has an operating system on it. Not necessarily for malicious concerns, although, for some companies, that is also a concern. In this instance, it was really just a concern of, has it been improved somehow? Like by changing power profiles, by changing some bio settings, something we might not be aware of. So uh, we shelved that unit and we decided to use the one that I bought instead for this review. And this was my first impression of the device. Ew. And our second impression was the claw sounding like it was dying, except it's a feature. Before that, this video is brought to you by Lian Lee and the O11D Evo RGB case. The O11D Evo RGB is an updated entry to the famed O11 lineup, retaining heavy support for fan mounts, drive mount locations, and flexibility on component mounting, such as two options for the power supply. The O11D Evo RGB's dual chamber approach aims to maximize cable storage on the backside to streamline cable management. Coupling this with a unique vertical GPU mount to showcase the most expensive part in most systems. Learn more at the link in the description below. Intel is rare among handhelds. It technically is out there. You can find it in the GPD, you can find it in some 1X player devices. But generally speaking, all the big names are using AMD's solution, the 7840U, the 8840U, or the Z1 Extreme, all of which are functionally the same chip. MSI, however, is selling three variants. An Ultra 7155H model with a one terabyte drive for $800, it's what we bought. The same, but 512 gigabytes for $750. And an Ultra 5 135H model with a 512 gigabyte drive for 700 bucks. The $800 model is more expensive than the top tier offering from Valve, that's $650, and from Asus at $700, and Lenovo actually at $750. And that's just the MSRP for them, that's ignoring the sale prices. MSI is entering the competition against powerful opponents that are already slashing prices on first gen models and open box units. The Asus Ally Z1 non extreme can be had for 400 bucks now. And given that, especially, it's half the price of the claw, the others are all cheaper than it, the claw's performance has to be indisputably strong. And it's not. And we'll talk about that in the review. It's actually still pretty interesting. Let's address the obvious part first, though. It looks like an Ally. Could be coincidence. But either way, the Ally was first to market and it makes this look and feel basically the same. There are small differences. The Ally's grips flow into the back more gradually. The shape and positioning of the claw's rear buttons isn't as good, and these are subtle changes. For the most part, the claw handles exactly the same as an Ally, except with a disgustingly squishy bumper button that just sinks on press. It'd be like if you damped your keyboard switch with 
Jello. For our money, the cushy grips on the deck and the Legion Go are more comfortable than either, despite the uh, ergo gaming science of comfort achieving perfection through anthropometry. Define anthropometry. Here's the definition of anthropometry, the scientific study of the measurements and proportions of the human body. Perfection through that. The claw's weight is higher than that of an ally, 670 grams by our measurements versus 615 grams, probably due to the claw's larger cooler, which MSI calls the Cooler Boost Hyperflow. Define Cooler Boost Hyperflow. Didn't find anything. Software is make or break for these devices, so it's time to move to that. The inevitable manufacturer front-end software on the claw is called the MSI Center M. And if you're familiar with MSI's recursive acronym naming, like the MSI MEG, MAG, and MPG, where all the M's stand for MSI, and so we have the MSI MSI Performance Gaming, where MSI stands for MicroStar International, so it's actually the MicroStar International, MicroStar International Performance Gaming, then we can also assume that MSI Center M is basically the MSI Center MSI. MSI really needs some more words that start with M other than MSI. MSI. The UI is clumsy. Compared to the more mature software from Valve and Asus, we ran into problems immediately upon turning the device on as well. If you don't open the software on boot, opening the overlay for the first time will bring up the main window and trigger an interrupt. Once the overlay is open, tapping the B button doesn't close it. These are some really basic things that you have to get right on a handheld since it doesn't have a normal mouse and keyboard normally. We also had some problems with the overlay not intercepting clicks, meaning that menus behind the overlay would be activated when, in fact, you are trying to click on the interactive pop-out overlay. In general, the software doesn't respond to input logically, and when it does, it can be difficult to navigate and it feels like it was retrofitted from a desktop rather than built ground up for a handheld device that has different inputs. The most important aspect of the software, though, is the so-called user scenario which is maybe indicative of MSI's other software problems because the names are often nonsense or convey little to no meaning to the user. What user scenario or user mode actually does is change the power profile. These are extreme performance, or aka performance, balanced super battery manual and AI engine. These profiles just set good old Intel PL1 and PL2 values that we've detailed in the past, although they're adjusted for this silicate we liked that the performance profile also offers the option to individually customize fan curves for each of the two fans, which is a great feature that MSI decided not to logically apply anywhere else at all. It isn't available in any other power modes, again reinforcing a sort of half-assed approach that their developers can probably navigate thoughtlessly, but actual users end up with an inconsistent and unclear experience. In fact, even the manual mode doesn't support fan curve adjustment. Conversely, manual offers the ability to set PL1 and PL2 from 20 to 40 watts on wall power and 20 to 35 watts on battery power, but none of the others offer this. We'd like it if MSI unified the software options more though. We secured an official table of the predefined PL1 and PL2 values for each power mode, also visible through hardware info. DC is battery power and AC is connected to the charger. And of the predefined profiles, performance changes the most significantly based on whether a charger is connected. And it exceeds the values that can be manually set through the manual profile. Yet another inconsistency in MSI's interface. Super battery also disables the claws RGB lighting, but that's a decision we agree with. If you're looking for help or information like this, it may have to come directly from MSI support if they even have the answer. MSI has three resources, the official guide, the official subreddit, and the official forum. The guide is moderately helpful, but the subreddit and the forum are both abandoned wastelands, uh, all of a month after launch, because nobody bought claws apparently, actually, literally, based on our experience buying one. As of this writing, the largest ally subreddit has 70,000 members to the clause 92. 92. 92 total. It's not shorthand, not 92,000. 92! This, of course, isn't an indication of success or quality, but it's definitely an indication of popularity. Even the relatively niche Legion Go has a larger community, and that community regularly makes feature requests that are, sometimes impressively, granted by the software team. But now we get to the secret feature, the number one guaranteed sales generator right now.
It's two very special letters strapped to a noun. MSI's AI engine. MSI says that it automatically switches between the profiles for three things, the power modes we just described, Nehemic audio, and RGB lighting modes. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, that's three simple options that could be handled with a matrix and a lookup table, which would completely negate any importance of AI and relegate it to functionally a table. But, Moving on, it seems like the idea is that if you launch a game, the device will swap to appropriate power, sound, and lighting modes automatically. We say seems like because it isn't really clear how or if it works or what working properly might even mean. Intel Graphics Command Center was installed out of the box, but Intel Arc Control was not even on the review sample that MSI had screwed around with and we decided not to use. Even when updates are delivered through MSI Center M, some of them just get unceremoniously dumped into the downloads folder. This is uh, expected behavior though for Center M for some reason. MSI has left display related controls to Intel and Microsoft, which means that there is no battery saving refresh rate cap available through MSI Center M. There is a BIOS function. BIOS appears to be a normal MSI laptop setup, but without any performance controls beyond the ones accessible within the OS. It's definitely not as feature rich as the Go's BIOS. There's enough functionality to navigate a Windows install, but that's about it. That is until you hit the secret right control, right shift, left alt, F2 key combo to open up the real BIOS controls, including the ability to set ratios, disable cores, or do anything else you'd normally do in a desktop BIOS. Accessing the BIOS already requires holding right bumper and right trigger during boot, so we're not particularly happy to see that MSI is hiding the actually useful functions beyond a second hidden key combo. It's not, not supposed to be like an NES game, where you smash buttons on the start screen and try to find secrets. This should actually be obvious. As for control differences, the claw comes with Hall Effect joysticks out of the box, which is a plus, but negated by those bumpers we mentioned. We suspect MSI is using the exact same 7 inch 120 hertz variable refresh IPS touchscreen on the claw because even the bezels are precisely the same size. We measured them. Although as a whole, the claw is approximately 0.5 centimeters taller and one centimeter wider. We want good competition for the Ally because the Ally is becoming increasingly difficult for us to recommend. Now, arguably, the ROG Ally D1 Extreme, especially, is still the best choice among handhelds overall. The deck has a lot of strengths. We've talked about them at length now, especially the frame time pacing. But generally speaking, the Ally Z1X is extremely competitive. It's had big price drops on the Z1 non-extreme. Uh, and all of that makes it compelling in sort of the upper echelon of them and in the budget class. But during our testing, the ROG Ally for this review had more problems than any other device we worked with. And that is starting to become concerning because it's been a trend for the Ally. We had to reset Windows on the Z1 in order to get any updates to install. We already have a defective thumbstick, a rapidly degrading battery, and a broken micro SD card slot unless we want to send it out for warranty. So let's look at the Claws hardware. All Claw variants come with 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5-6400, matched to the Ally and the Deck OLED, and a 53 watt hour six cell battery, but only the top tier comes with a one terabyte drive. We generally prefer the one terabyte option. So saving 50 bucks by dropping to the 512 gigabyte claw, we think isn't worth it. Disregarding the drive size, the Ultra 5 model might deserve some consideration if it were meaningfully discounted. The CPU core count is really the only meaningful place you see big differences with a drop from six P cores, eight E cores, and two LPE cores with 22 threads total two 4P cores, 8E cores, and 2LBE cores. But the GPU component is almost the same between the two models. So with a big enough discount, the 135H could definitely become interesting because on paper, it's less of a downgrade than the Ally Z1 versus the Ally Z1 Extreme, or just the Z1 versus the Z1 Extreme parts in general. Having a single port for charging and for IO has proven extremely annoying on both the deck and the Ally. And we were hugely appreciative of what Lenovo did with the Legion Go, which was the utterly mind-blowing revolutionary concept of adding two USB ports. And MSI proves our own point about the USB thing. MSI says you'll need a powered hub in order to update BIOS. They say updating BIOS requires USB drive 
and a hover docking with an adapter connected. MSI sells an $80 Nest docking station with definitely not ASUS inspired packaging, but it recommends upgrading to a 100 watt charger in order to use it. One tiny feature worth praising is the tactile bumps that have been molded above the USB and the micro SD card slots, which we like because it makes it easier to tell them apart in a dark room. Our first set of benchmarks is for battery life, and it includes some normalized results where we can look at either FPS normalized or battery life sort of survivability normalized. The Claw is equipped with a 53 watt hour battery. It's the largest we've tested so far, although it's essentially tied with the DEC OLED and the Legion Go. All automatic power saving features like screen dimming were disabled for testing. For now, we set a 50% screen brightness. However, this is one of our only uncontrolled variables in testing since 50% can be different things on different screens. Our future testing includes NITS normalization though, so that'll be pretty cool once we roll it out. This first chart is super interesting. We've added average FPS in the benchmark next to the devices and then the battery in the bar. Remember that this doesn't tell the full story, of course, so we'll look at the lows and the frame times later, but it allows us to start showing performance and battery life at the same time since both are critical. This test uses F1 with the frame rate cap disabled, but resolution enforced on all devices to the same. We have a chart with performance results using the same settings coming up as well, and that'll give us a look at efficiency. This is super cool though, because as a data point, we haven't seen it discussed elsewhere too much. The Claw's Asus Z1X competition ran for 2.1 hours in silent at 38 FPS, not much of a performance contender, and 1.4 hours with performance at 84 FPS average. The Z1 performance and the Claw balanced are equals for battery life, which means that normalized for battery drain, the A1M is actually far superior in this specific title. Its normalized advantage is around 50% here. Then it does have a lot of problems, but we'll talk with those at the frame time pacing later. The heavier workload allowed the Claw's power profiles to differentiate themselves, but even here, there is only a five minute improvement between performance and balance. They're just not that different. Reducing the profile to super battery significantly extended the Claw's battery life, up 35% from performance and at nearly two hours, but that does come with a hit to FPS. The drop is from 84 FPS to 68 between balanced and super battery, meaning that balanced performs about 24% better for FPS, and more on that soon. The Go's power saving profile tops the chart, but at a basically unplayable frame time consistency that makes it irrelevant. The more useful comparison is in performance mode, where it holds 109 FPS average at 1.4 hours of life. The DEC OLED is a chart leader here, up at 2.3 hours for 84 FPS average. Normalized for FPS, and this is the really cool data, the Ally Z1X in performance also held 84 FPS average, so they're the same there, but at a reduced 1.4 hour battery. That means the DEC OLED lasts 64% longer at the same FPS in this very specific test, and that's pretty impressive. And we can do a lot more with this data in the future as we expand it. Our next battery life test is dead cells, run at the native resolution V-Sync refresh rate for each device. This is intentional and it represents normal use. The Claw's performance is good among the high refresh devices we've tested, although there's no specific improvement between performance and super battery modes. The super battery power limit is too high to show a significant advantage with this light workload as compared to the AMD devices, which have stricter limits, and that's good here. So Intel definitely could improve because AMD can go lower on the limitations. And the performance and balance results for MSI are within variance of each other here. The Claw's best time was 4.8 hours in this test, which gives it a real advantage of the Ally Z1X's best of 2.8 hours, obviously helped by the larger battery. Because this test allows native resolution and refresh, the Legion Go is disadvantaged and falls behind. The Ally, however, loses in a scenario closer to a like-for-like -like and has the worst battery life of all these devices. The Steam Deck OLED comes out on top by a huge margin at 8.3 hours with its large battery and efficient screen, although its relatively low resolution and refresh rate also benefit it here. And the same applies for the Deck LCD. There's more to it than all that though. That's what the gaming tests are for and that's what we're getting into now. So for gaming, we eliminate FPS caps, we do not use any variable refresh rate features, that's for measuring accurately, and all tests were performed on battery power unless otherwise listed using different profiles. The Steam Deck does not have different power profiles. It's got basically one thing it does, uh, and it also does not benefit from being plugged in while gaming. So that's how we test these. Now, important thing here is that the words don't mean anything. So when it says performance, that's a manufacturer defined name for whatever their power profile does. So performance on, for example, the Legion Go 
and the claw, they're not the same, especially because they're two completely different CPU and GPU solutions. Uh, so you shouldn't be looking at those. Likewise, the actual power number, so how AMD and Intel define TDP, that's different. Uh, but what we're doing is showing you the mix of battery and gaming to help with all of that. Resident Evil 4 was a title with frame pacing issues that are difficult to represent on a bar chart because of their inconsistency, and we'll look at a frame time plot for that in a moment. The claw's performance and balanced profiles are tied for about 59 FPS average, but although the balanced and super battery profiles appear to have superior lows, in reality, the run-to-run -run variance was so high that they end up just being sort of unreliable in the lows altogether. They were equally stuttery in real life. You can't extract any meaning from these lows because the singular spikes blow out the averaging. We'll look at that in a second. This instability overshadows the fact that the claw is actually at the top of the chart in terms of average FPS, surpassing the Legion Go and the Ally Z1X, and actually outstripping the deck OLED by as much as 31% from best from the claw to worst of the deck. But none of that matters. Here's where it gets really bad. This is a frame time plot. We're representing frame time or the frame to frame interval on the left axis and then the frame counts on the bottom. In this instance, the claw ran into a seriously bad frame time spike to 600 milliseconds and another nearing 400 milliseconds. A 600 millisecond frame time is clear as day to see, and it feels like a heavy stutter. We can actually simulate one really accurately in post-production, so you can just see what it feels like. We'll put it on the screen now, and that is how long the pause is in real play. We're matching it to the exact 600 millisecond window you're seeing in this chart. At 1080p, the clause frame pacing issues continue, making it difficult to get reliable results. The addition of a wall-powered result pushes the average FPS for the Go and the Ally Z1X to equal the claw, but the top results on the chart all level out around 43 FPS. The more stable pacing of the non-claw handhelds make for a better experience here regardless of the overall averages, highlighted by the 4 FPS balanced 0.1% low result, which is terrible. And that is a particularly nasty frame time spike once again. Maybe a different game will help. So, Cyberpunk, we set each upscaling method to an equivalent percent upscaling from source resolution, that's 66% of the width and 66% of the height in Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA terminology. Here's the chart. Cyberpunk 2077 was one of the worst performing games we ran on the claw relative to the rest of the chart. We saw a consistent hitching that persisted even when we exited the test area. Unfortunately, the frame time inconsistency down at 3 FPS with 0.1% lows made the game unplayable in a way that the overall 30 FPS average doesn't reflect. Now we're showing this up front, we actually have an example on the screen, because this is what you can expect from the claw. Some games will run terribly, or not at all. The Z1X handhelds top the chart here, led by the Ally Z1X's 25 watt turbo mode at 59 FPS average, with the Steam Deck OLED demonstrating its typically stable frame times and its primary advantage, which is frame time pacing. Remember that for Asus, turbo mode will drastically shorten battery life, and in this instance, you can expect a sub one hour battery. The more balanced performance mode would put it at 41 FPS average with a better battery time. The low power modes for the two Ally handhelds and the Go land at the bottom of the chart by a long shot. These modes aren't suitable for anything beyond 2D gaming. Meanwhile, the Claw's super battery mode isn't much worse than its performance or balanced modes. If anything, MSI could cut the power further here if the Intel part supported it. But super battery is the lowest power level accessible through the UI, matching the minimum assured power for the 155H on ARC. Not Again, not that arc, that's a different one. The claws performance and balanced modes are tied at about 30 FPS average, with the five watt power limit increase not enough to make any kind of difference here. The Z1 non-extreme is about half the price we paid for the claw, and its performance is roughly equal to the claw's best result, which is embarrassing for MSI's double the price solution. Even more embarrassing is that the Ally, the Z1, the cheap one, non-extreme, is blowing out the claw for frame time pacing, and that matters more than just the average. 1080p, we drop the low power profiles and add tests with wall power. The MSI claw positioning remains the same. The bump to PL1 and PL2 from connecting the charger is relevant to its performance in this test, and the average remains 27 FPS with the worst lows on the entire chart. They are consistently inconsistent, making for a consistently bad experience. This is in contrast to devices like the Legion Go and especially the Ally Z1X, 
both of which gain some additional performance when plugged in. The deck doesn't benefit in FPS from being plugged in. F1 2023 is up now. These pair with our thermal and battery test. The claw is tied here in average FPS with the deck OLED and the Ally Z1X's performance 15 watt power profile. The deck OLED remains the most consistent for frame time pacing, although the super battery A1M claw result is more consistent than the flanking Z1 entries. The two Z1X powered handhelds pull significantly ahead with their highest power profiles applied at 118 FPS and 109 FPS for the results, while neither the deck OLED nor the claw have any additional headroom. Red Dead Redemption 2 Vulcan ran well on the claw with lows that compare favorably to the rest of the chart. The claw's best case 62 FPS average is 7% ahead of the Ally Z1X's performance 15 watt profile, although the Ally Z1X's battery draining turbo profile tops the chart at 66. At 1080p, the Z1X powered devices hit a clear limit around 43 FPS. Connecting the claw to wall power resulted in actually a lower average of 38, which is a pattern we validated across multiple titles, and it has to do with thermal throttling. More on that soon. Baldur's Gate 3 reliably produces low 1% and 0.1% numbers, but the claw has worse frame pacing than the rest of the entries on this chart. The Z1 non-extreme does particularly well here, and on any given day, it's $400 cheaper than the claw. In Dying Light 2, the claw's best of 49 FPS is behind the Ally Z1X's best of 56, with its turbo profile and within variance of the Legion Go's best of 50 FPS. Super Battery reduced the average frame rate, with 24% improvement from Super Battery to Balanced. At 1080p, the Z1X and 155H devices begin to level off. The claw connected to wall power with the performance profile did worse than it did on battery power, which again is something we've seen repeatedly now in other games. Now for charging testing. Our most basic charging test is done with each device fully powered off and dead enough to shut itself down. This testing is done with the included charger because we consider the charger to be part of the product, so we measure its behavior in combination with the device. The claw started off pulling the full 65 watt capacity of its wall charger, just like the Legion Go, although the Go went a couple watts beyond the rating. Afterwards, the claw settled into lower power thresholds before finishing completely at 76 minutes charge. That's the fastest charge time among the devices shown on this chart, which is impressive given that it also has the largest battery. Here's a rough chart to illustrate that point, generated with some log data that we already had on hand. This chart is truncated before the devices reach 100% charge, but the point here is that the claw follows a steeper curve than the other devices, shown by the hump in this line, storing more energy quicker. The claw has the fastest charging rate among devices we've tested, but whether it can make efficient use of that energy is a separate matter. Here's the thermal situation. In a full torture workload where we have the device charging while gaming in its maximum power profile, the claw produces these numbers. Because it's charging, the charger I see is heating up the system in areas that aren't directly contacted by the cold plate. And that's alongside the battery heat and the SOC heat being generated. There's a lot of heat in this box right now, and anywhere we're CPU bound, such as initial loading of the assets, this is seen in the first few minutes, the temperature climbs to 101 degrees on the hottest core of any given row of data. That could indicate bad contact distribution of the cooler, but it could equally be indicative of hotspots within the CPU, such as on a priority core. You also see this spike happen anytime we're in a loading screen. With the GPU load, which is when we're running laps in F1 in this test, the temperature stays generally around 75 degrees for the cores and 86 for the hottest of the cores. Any shift to CPU only load, like the loading screen that happens around 700 seconds, 1300 seconds, 1700 seconds, and 2400 seconds, spikes us up to 101 degrees. It's technically one degree over this chart bound. We'll overlay a layer for the frequency. These spikes always happen just after the CPU frequency spikes to around 3900 MHz. As with Intel's desktop CPUs, insufficient cooling means the solution can't tame the huge push for frequency. The good news is that it wasn't throttling the CPU during the GPU load in this game. The bad news is that it was throttling sometimes, and it's not as controlled as it should be. Now our conclusion for this is an interesting one. It's kind of fun for me, because we normally do the objective analysis for the conclusion and some subjective opinions that are formed in the lab here. But in this instance, because I was already flying during the review cycle, I used the, not this version, but the Taiwan one we bought on the plane and got to use it in a sort of real environment where it's intended to be used. And that gives some unique perspective. And so we'll approach that side first. So these are my opinions on it as a handheld in general. In the cramped and torturous environment of a 14 hour flight, that's 10 hours into a 24 hour journey, you really stop caring about the specifics of frame rate a lot. What mattered to me were only two things. 
that it was playable, and that meant 20 FPS in non-precision games was fine, as long as it was consistent, that's the key part, and not stuttery, and that it had good battery life. If the device died in an hour, it wouldn't be worth the carry-on luggage space. Without using it in a controlled way, I was switching between brightness, power profiles, purely based on how I felt as an end user, not how I felt as a tester. I ended up with about an hour and 45 minutes of playtime in Brew Barons, which is an awesome game, but not a lot of time. This is where we get to the interesting insight side of things from being in that environment. Purely subjectively, I could not possibly have cared any less about an extra five FPS in that environment. All I cared about was this thing does its job well enough to distract me from being on this plane for 14 hours, and it needs to live long enough to take away as much of that uh, experience as possible. So that's what I cared about. Now, that boils down really to a couple things additionally, which is value and battery. And on the value side, it's much worse value than competing devices. It is $800, uh, and the battery life is also not the best. So it's in two losing positions. You could use the in-seat charger. The charger's low enough wattage that most planes will support it if their in-seat charger is working, if your neighbor's not using it, if you're okay with being that guy who trips everyone who needs to get out of the row that you're in. Uh, but the battery still matters the most. Additional thoughts, the overlay was at times annoying. I did have occasional crashes as a result of a mix of the ARC drivers and uh, the super battery power state. And if I were to take a device not for review, as in I personally get to choose what I want to not work on the plane, then I would not choose this device. I'd bring either the Ally or uh, the deck instead. Now to the objective side. In the game test we ran, the claw could perform up to the level of an Ally Z1 Extreme, but with an identical screen spec, the same memory capacity, more storage, and potentially more battery life, that makes the claw sound better. But it's not. The claw's one-word summary is inconsistent. It also doesn't bode well for the claw that its bottom-tier power profile isn't strongly differentiated from its highest in comparison to the other devices. If you're trying to maximize battery life, that's as low as the slider goes. The existence of the claw is a mystery. We suspect there may be some Intel marketing development fund involved or something, because otherwise, why would you do this? Uh, even the Legion Go is cheaper, and the Go has a higher resolution. It has a higher refresh rate, faster memory. It supports 2242 SSDs. It has detachable controllers, whether you view them as a gimmick or not. And we're happy to see some silicon variety with the claw and Intel. But you don't buy because of variety. You buy because value and good. And it's clear why manufacturers have stuck with the safe choice of a Z1 variant or a 7840U in most cases. As for what we would recommend instead, the Ally Z1 Extreme has the highest performance per dollar with some reliability issues. We've talked about those at length. The Deck OLED has a good balance of battery life, screen quality, and price combined with stable frame times. And the Ally Z1 Non-Extreme has become a competitive budget choice with huge discounts as low as $300 to $400 or so. If the top tier claw drops to price parity with the top tier Ally Z1 Extreme, we'll reevaluate. The conclusion, as simply as possible, is this. There's no reason to settle for good enough when better is cheaper. And that's it for this review. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. We have more handhelds we're working on. We're moving into some core component reviews for PC parts as well. And uh, to help us out in funding these reviews because they are massive and extremely expensive and time consuming for us uh, on the testing side, go to store.gamersaccess.net, consider grabbing one of these shirts, one of our PC building mod mats for your projects, whether that's just in the garage or building a computer, uh, or one of our projects and soldering mats, our coaster packs, or other items on store.gamersaccess.net. Or go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess to throw us a few bucks. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.